right, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Tony Duvall. I'm the Chief of Police here in the city of Tacoma Park. Uh, tonight, we are holding a Ward 2 public safety meeting. Uh, we held one last year around the same time. We think it's very important that we come to each ward in the city because crime in each respective ward is different. Um, and I'm going to introduce some, uh, some people joining me uh, this evening. Uh, to my left is our Deputy Chief Shabu Filipos. Uh, standing by the door, and I don't know if he can be caught on the camera, is our Emergency Preparedness Manager, Ron Hardy. Uh, up at the table to my right is Kathy Plevy, um, our executive, my executive assistant. She's also our public information officer. Um, Misha Rowe is our crime analyst. She's going to be presenting uh, crime across the city and more specifically in Ward 2. Um, sitting in the audience, we have our traffic uh, corporal, uh, Thomas Sims. Uh, we have our uh, admin captain, Michelle Holmes. We have our investigative uh, lieutenant, uh, Joseph uh, Butler. Uh, we have our patrol commander, Matthew Mazzotti. Um, we have our uh, operations commander, uh, Captain Cody Evans. And also joining us, we have uh, our city manager, Rob Despierto, and our um, council member, Cindy Dabala. So before we get started, we're going to turn it over to uh, council member Dabala and uh, our city manager to say a few words. So we just need to get her a mic because we're so the people at, at home can, uh, people on Zoom can hear you as well. So just for everyone in the audience, if we're having a conversation because we have people on Zoom and it's being recorded, we're going to hand Hello. you a mic. So if you're asking a question, we want people at home to be able to hear it. So we'll pass the mic around to you and that way people at home can hear, hear what we're saying. I just want to first thank the police chief and the rest of the staff for coming out and doing this. Uh, there's been a lot going on in Ward 2. There's a lot to talk about. And um, I've lived here a very long time. And like the rest of you, I perceive that there's more crime. And they're going to tell us that we're right and what we can do about it, which I think is great. And so thank you very much. And I really would like to introduce um, the new city manager for Tacoma Park, Rob Despirito. Thank you, council member. Thank you, uh, chief. And uh, Welcome, everybody. I uh, am relatively new to the community. It's been about two months, but I can't think of the kind of meeting that means more to me than coming out and have an opportunity to listen to folks, whether you're here in person or virtually. Uh, what are your concerns, particularly about something as basic and important to you as, uh, the public, as public safety, as, as the safety to you and your family and your neighbors. Uh, this is something that the police department, the mayor and the council, and my staff and I take extremely seriously uh, on an ongoing basis. And we don't always have all the answers. We rely on you as residents and from our visitors and others in the community to tell us how, you know, how we're doing, what we could do better, what you like, what you don't like and ultimately some things that we just might not be aware of that we ought to address. So we do take it very seriously, and uh, we're honored by the opportunity to listen to you. And I uh, look forward to getting to know you. Thank you. And one more thing. Um, there'll probably be questions if there are not immediate answers. Tonight we will follow up for sure. And I believe there are a lot of people online, so don't feel lonely. There's just a whole bunch of people out in the cyberspace. Yeah, and just to, to reiterate what Councilmember Dabala said, this, this meeting will be is recorded. It will be on our website as well as all the PowerPoints. You don't need to take pictures of the PowerPoints or anything else. Uh, and if there's a question that we don't answer this evening, the majority of this, this tonight is going to be answering questions from you all. Um, the first part of it is going to be a presentation about crime stats here in Ward 2. But if there's a question that we did not or were unable to answer, uh, please feel to follow up the please feel free to follow up with uh, Kathy and we'll get that, that question answered. So we're going to go ahead and start the evening with a presentation on crime stats uh, by our, our crime analyst, Misha Rowe. Can everyone see that PowerPoint okay from the back? Okay, we'll leave the lights on. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me? Is that on? Okay, yeah. Um, my name is Misha Rowe. I'm the crime analyst for the Tacoma Park Police Department. Um, and I'm just going to be giving this PowerPoint presentation going um, over a basic overview of the statistics that we saw in Ward 2 specifically, as well as the rest of Tacoma Park um, in 2023. Um, so to just give a brief overview of what the presentation will consist of, 
Um, we'll be going over the part one crimes that we saw in 2023 in all of Tacoma Park. Then we'll be concentrating on the statistics in Ward 2. Um, and then narrowing in a little more on the top five repeated locations of crime incidents in Ward 2 in 2023. And then given... And then uh, give an overview of the uh, trends and patterns that we saw in burglaries, robberies, thefts from autos, and motor vehicle thefts in Ward 2 in 2023, uh, following a brief overview of assaults that we saw in Ward 2 and property crimes um, overview in 2023. So to start off, here is a chart that um, just displays a comparison of the cr number of crime incidents that we saw in 2022 compared to 2023. Um, and the change that we saw over that period of time. That's because you changed. Everything good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so to continue, um, to uh, clarify some things, part one crimes, what we're talking about there are the crimes that are used mainly in crime analytics that consists of homicide, rape, robbery, burglaries, assaults, larcenies, theft from autos, and auto thefts. Um, this does not include uh, petty crimes, uh, drug offenses, vandalisms, um, warrant arrests, et cetera, um, that do occur that we do keep track of, but for the purposes of this presentation, um, we're mostly talking about part one crimes. So there was a, Excuse me, there was a 50% increase in total part one crimes from 2022 to 2023 throughout the entire city of Tacoma Park. Um, those numbers consisted of 716 total part one crimes in 2022 um, compared to 1,073 total part one crimes in 2023. Um, crimes that we saw a decrease in from 2022 to 2023 were homicide and rape. Um, homicide decreased by 100%, rape decreased by 33.33%. Uh, and the crimes which we saw an increase uh, from 2022 to 2023 uh, were robbery, assault, burglary, larceny, thefts from autos, and auto thefts. Robberies increased by 150%. Um, and I do also want to uh, point out in that it's important to note that some of these uh, percent changes, some of these percentages can look very alarming, um, like percent changes over 100%. Um, it is important to note that um, Tacoma Park is a, quite a small jurisdiction, so we are working with much more relatively small numbers than surrounding jurisdictions, and so that's why the percent changes can appear much more dramatic. But um, as you can see, the numbers we're working with are relatively small, uh, but I just wanted to uh, make that note so that, that you are aware when you see those some, some of those numbers. Um, assaults increased by 60%, burglaries increased by 5%, larceny increased by 69%, thefts from autos increased by 20%, and auto thefts increased by 56%. So Ward 6 uh, was the ward in which we saw the most crime in 2023. Um, it, can, it accounted for 52% of the crime incidents that we saw in 2023. Ward 2 uh, accounted for 23% of the crime incidents that we saw in 2023, um, which equated to 249 incidents in the year of 2023. Uh, the wards that saw a decrease um, from 2022 to 2023 was Ward 3, saw a 19% decrease. Um, and all the other wards in Tacoma Park saw in, an increase from 2022 to 2023. Ward 1 saw a 12% increase. Ward 2 saw a 54% increase. Ward 4 saw a 39% increase. Ward 4 saw an 89, per, Ward 5, excuse me, uh, saw an 89% increase. And Ward 6 saw a 79% increase from 2022 to 2023. Um, and this is just a visual um, displaying the um, number of crime incidents in each ward and how much that accounted for in the total um, numbers of crime incidents that we saw in Tacoma Park for the year of 2023. And to reiterate, Ward 2 accounted for approximately 23% of crime in the city of, to city of Tacoma Park in 2023. And this is just a visual um, denoting the um, percent change in crime incidents that we saw in 2022 to 2023 for each ward that uh, we discussed earlier. And then, let me, hello, okay. And then to focus in on Ward 2, um, this 
uh, visual displays the amount of part one crimes that we saw in War Two for the year of 2023 and the percent change that we saw in War Two from 2022 to 2023 for each type of crime. So in 20, from 2022 to 2023, homicides are, saw a 0% change um, in War Two, rape saw a 0% change in War Two. Robbery saw a 500% increase in War Two. Assault saw a 163% increase. Burglary saw a 6% increase. Larceny saw a 72% increase. Thefts from autos saw an 8% increase. And auto theft saw a 143% increase. And again, from 2022 to 23, the War Two saw a total increase of 54%. And this is an over. This is a statistical overview of the crimes in War II that we saw for each month in 2023. And again, all this information and in, um, in the PowerPoint will be made available um, to everyone on the website after the meeting. But I'll just give you a few moments to uh, look at this visual. And then this visual. Yeah, absolutely. So the question was um, to explain the difference between larceny and robbery. Larceny is theft, uh, plain and simple. Robbery is any theft with an element of assault that is intentional. Um, so larceny can be just you know taking something is, that isn't yours, going into a store, taking something, leaving. Robbery, um, it is a theft, and there has to be an element of assault present, whether that is um, you know, strong arm with one's hands, feet, and fists, et cetera, or a weapon such as a knife or a gun. And so again, this chart uh, displays the amount of War II incidents that accounted for the entire uh, percentage of crime, in inc crime incidents that we saw in Tacoma Park in 2023. So War II accounted for 0% of homicides, 0% of rape, 30% of robberies, 24% of assaults, 36% of burglaries, 19% of larcenies, 28% of thefts from autos, 20% of motor vehicle thefts, and again, 23% of all uh, crime in Tacoma Park for 2023. So going, um, narrowing in on War II just a little further, uh, the top five repeated or hotspot locations in War II that we saw in 2023 were the following. Uh, there is the 711 um, on the 6900 block of New Hampshire Avenue. We had 57 crime reports from that location in 2023. The Seneca gas station on uh, the 6900 block of New Hampshire Avenue, we saw 39 crime reports. Uh, the Seneca gas station on the 6300 block of New Hampshire Avenue saw 10 reports. The, six, the Marathon gas station on the 64. 100 block of New Hampshire Avenue saw eight reports, and the Grace United Methodist Church on New Hampshire Avenue saw six reports in 2023. And then we're going to go into some of an overview of the types of crimes that we saw at those locations in 2023, just to give you a better idea of what we had going on in Ward 2. So the 711 on New Hampshire Avenue in 2023, we saw one aggravated assault, one larceny, 46 shopliftings, one motor vehicle theft four robberies, two vandalisms, one trespassing, excuse me, one trespassing, uh, one counterfeit or forgery incident. And then the Seneca gas station and the 6900 block of New Hampshire Avenue, we saw one aggravated assault, four simple assaults, two disorderly conducts, three warrant arrests, one larceny, 23 shopliftings, two trespassings, and three vandalisms. The Seneca gas station on the 6300 block of New Hampshire Avenue, we saw one aggravated assault, one motor vehicle theft, one simple assault, and seven thefts from autos. The Marathon gas station, we had one burglary, four robberies, one simple assault, and two thefts from autos. And at Grace United Methodist Church, we had three burglaries, one larceny, one simple assault, and one trespassing. So to go over some of the trends and patterns that we saw um, of each type of crime incident in 2023 in Ward 2, uh, specifically, with burglaries in Ward 2, Sunday saw the highest occurrence of burglary incidents in Ward 2 in 2023. Um, and it is also important to note that the exact time of some burglary incidents was not able to be determined as it occurred overnight or over um, a period of many hours or even many days. So it was definitely difficult to sometimes narrow down the exact time of when some of these burglaries occurred. 
But uh, from what we do know, the most common occurrences of burglary incidents in Ward 2, that's supposed to say Ward 2, not Ward 6, my apologies, in 2023 have been Tuesdays at 1900 hours. Um, and then this is a map displaying the locations of several of the burglary incidents that we saw in Ward 2 in 2023. Then moving on to robberies, Friday saw the highest occurrence of robbery incidents in 2023 in Ward 2. And the most common occurrences of robbery incidents in 2023 in Ward 2 have been Fridays at 1400 hours. And this is a map displaying the locations of the robbery incidents that we saw in Ward 2 in 2023. And then moving on to thefts from autos, Fridays have seen the highest occurrence of theft from auto incidents in Ward 2 in 2023. And the most common occurrence of theft from auto incidents in Ward 2 in 2023 have been Thursdays at 1300 hours and Sundays at 100 hours. Um, it is also important to note that similar to burglary incidents, the exact times and occurrences um, of several theft from auto incidents are unknown because they occurred over a period of several days or several hours overnight. And this is a map displaying uh, several locations that we saw theft from auto incidents happen in, in 2023. And then with motor vehicle thefts, Thursdays and Fridays saw the highest occurrence of motor vehicle theft incidents in Ward 2 in 2023. And the most common occurrence of motor vehicle theft incidents in Ward 2 was Fridays at uh, 3 a.m. and 4 a.m., Thursdays at uh, midnight, and Mondays at 1 a.m. And also similar to theft from autos and burglaries, it's important to note that the exact time of many motor vehicle thefts incidents were undetermined because they occurred over a period, time period of several days or several hours overnight. And here is a map denoting several locations that we saw motor vehicle thefts incidents happen in War II in 2023. And then to give a brief overview of assault incidents that we saw in 2023, there were 88 assault incidents in 2023 um, total in Tacoma Park, and 21 out of these 88 in assault incidents occurred in War II. Approximately 52 out of the 88 assault incidents in all of Tacoma Park in 2023 were domestically related incidents that consisted of about 59%. And approximately six out of the 21 assault incidents that occurred in Ward 2 in 2023 were domestically related, about 29%. And then to give a brief overview of arrests and property crimes in 2023, this was a question that was asked at the previous meeting, so uh, I think your people would want to know. There were approximately 300, over 300 arrests, uh, excuse me. There were more than 300 arrests made in Tacoma Park in 2023. There were 922 part one property crimes that occurred in Tacoma Park, in, excuse me, in 2023. Um, again, that's burglaries, larcenies, theft from autos, and motor vehicle thefts. And there were 150, over 150 arrests made in relation to property crimes that occurred in all of Tacoma Park in 2023. Um, and out of all property crimes in Tacoma Park in 2023, that means at least 16% were cleared by arrests. Then specifically in Ward 2, we saw 210 Part 1 property crimes um, that occurred in 2023. And there were over 21 arrests made in relation to property crimes that occurred in Ward 2 in 2023, uh, meaning that at least 10% of these property crimes in Ward 2 were cleared by arrests in 2023. Um, and lastly, this is just another visual um, and a summary giving the, a brief crime overview of the crime that we saw in Ward 2 in 2023. Um, there were 34 burglary incidents in Ward 2. The most number of burglary incidents that we saw in 2023 occurred in November, uh, accounting for 36% of the burglaries that we saw in all of Tacoma Park. The number of theft from auto incidents that we saw in Ward 2 were 56. Uh, most of these theft from auto incidents occurred in August, um, which accounted for 28% of the theft from auto incidents that we saw in all of Tacoma Park for 2023. Uh, there were 17 motor vehicle theft incidents that occurred in Ward 2 in 2023, and the most motor vehicle thefts occurred in July, uh, accounting for 20% of the motor vehicle thefts in all of Tacoma Park. Um, in Ward 2, we saw 103 larceny incidents in 2023, and the majority of these occurred in January of 2023, accounting for 19% of the larcenies in all of Tacoma Park. We saw 18 robbery incidents in Ward 2 in 2023, the most of them occurring in January, <coughs> accounting for 30% of the robberies that we saw in Tacoma Park for, in all of Tacoma Park in 2023. And lastly, we had 21 assault incidents in Ward 2, 
uh, the majority occurring in October, accounting for 24% of assaults in 2023 in all of Tacoma Park. And that is it. Thank you very much, Misha. So we, we just wanted to give that overview before we get started, but I just, just want to touch on a few things. If you noticed on the presentation, the, the detail was very specific on wh what times crimes were occurring, and that's how we deploy resources, is based off of those hot spots. Uh, like you'll notice, eight of those robberies in Ward, uh, in Ward 2 were along New Hampshire Avenue at the gas stations. So we had a, an overtime detail specifically targeting that area. So I can't stress enough how important it is for residents to report crime to us because we utilize, like I say, this data to deploy our resources. Uh, we've had multiple, multiple overtime details, both plain clothes and, and uniform details to address crime hotspots within the city and specifically here in Ward 2. Uh, we continue to work with our partners in Prince George's County and the District of Columbia uh, to make sure that we are communicating uh, regarding incidents. Uh, we made um, an arrest last year for a person that had a, a committed a rash of, of robberies on the food trucks along New Hampshire Avenue. That resulted in several closures outside of our jurisdiction in Montgomery County. So that's really important. So uh, as you can see, 50% increase in crime in the city, 54% increase in Ward 2 were concerned. Uh, this is not unique to the city of Tacoma Park. We have traditionally been very insulated from, you know, violent crime. The, the numbers are still relatively low, but every one of those numbers has a victim or victims attached to it. So we're doing everything we can to make sure that we're keeping you safe. And part of that is having these meetings so we can receive feedback for you. Because we're looking at data, but data doesn't tell the whole story. You have... You are the stakeholders that have the eyes and ears and see what's going on. So we want to hear from you. So with that, what we're going to do is we're going to open it up to questions. We're going to take questions in three different ways. And if I can just ask everyone that's in the audience, if you're speaking, we're going to pass a mic around to you so the people that are at home can capture uh, what you're saying. We're going to rotate in from questions here in the audience. We're going to go to questions that are, uh, are, are put out on Zoom. And then we're going to address some questions that we received in advance. So uh, with that, I will open it up. Anyone that wants to ask right here, Ron? Yes, ma'am. Of the folks that you've arrested, the perpetrators, are they mostly local or are they from outside the Tacoma Park area? That's a very good question. Uh, probably over 70% of the people we arrest for crimes in the city do not live in the city, but we can get you those exact numbers. Um, when we did our, our comprehensive data release a few years ago, uh, that's what we found, that over 70% do not live in the city of Tacoma Park. Hi. Thank you for doing those meetings. I appreciate it. Um, I live at Kentland, New Hampshire, and Hopewell. Now, we have two local drug dealers, two RVs, literally parked right there. They're literally, I can see them every day. People walk in there, knock on the door, come back with a meth pipe, lighting them up right in front of the house. And I think we mentioned many times, do you think you guys can do something against those RVs dealing drugs? And I mean, the, the, literally, the church right across, a church, is getting robbed every couple weeks. Um, we have every week, we have a window broken into from a local elementary school teacher. Think about it, how savage that is. A church, a local elementary school teacher, people break into their cars, bang the windows, steal whatever they got. At daytime nowadays, they're banging the windows, steal whatever, especially from, let's say, a, um, somebody, a worker comes to fix your house, they literally just break the window and steal stuff. And now, at least in New Hampshire, Canland, Hopewell. My opinion, those drug dealers got to go. Uh, you bring up, a, we're, we're, we're keenly aware of the situation that, that you mentioned, and we're approaching it in multiple different ways. Uh, the first way is to address the parking issue, because some of those, they're parked illegally. The second thing is our plainclothes team, our special assignment team is aware um, I don't know if Lieutenant Butler wants to touch on that. We don't want to give a lot of detail about our plainclothes operations. But here's what I want from you all is if you see activity, call us because we can't be there at all times. But uh, Lieutenant Butler, I don't know if you want to 
say anything about our SWAT team. It's our special assignment team is our plainclothes team, but they're aware of it and they're conducting surveillance. We're aware of the connection between some of the incidents at the church and surrounding area that's tied to that particular area, uh, but we're doing everything we can to address it. Okay, can you just can you just wait and take the mic so the people at home can hear you? I mean, for for us, at least the neighborhood where we are living right now, I mean, people are nervous. People are slowly thinking about getting guns because people, don't, you know, we're scared. We're scared. All of us have children who are like elementary school age. And if they savagely rob a church, if they savagely rob an elementary school teacher, I mean, maybe they don't know. It doesn't matter. They still do it, and they don't care at daytime. And I can see people walking right in front of my house, and not even like hiding in the bushes, literally walk in front of my house and light up a crack pipe. I'm just saying, this is nervous. This makes me nervous, and I think it makes everybody nervous. I'm just no, I, echoing. I, 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 and I don't think there's anything gained by us getting guns, but th it, it, is, it is an issue that is coming up because I don't feel safe, and people are thinking about getting guns. Well, let me just say this. Uh, you know, I, I don't encourage residents to arm themselves to, to defend that. That's not the best solution. And I understand how you're feeling. I, I, I have five children myself. I understand how that is. Um, like I say, um, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of hit and miss because it's not illegal to walk on the street. It's obviously illegal to smoke meth on the street. So we are addressing it, but I cannot stress enough um, if you see something, call us, and we can come out and address it. And we will continue to work our angles to address it. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, people are very smart. And just to, to clarify, we haven't had any robberies related to them. They're, th they're thefts where they break in or burglaries. A robbery is where they use force. I don't think we've had anyone connected to there that's that. But I, I understand, um, you know, quality of life is paramount. Um, you know, people move to Tacoma Park because it's relatively safe and you want to feel safe and you want to feel where you can live in a community where you can walk with your kids and you don't have to be confronted by someone who's smoking meth. Um, so we're doing everything we can, um, like CFB, our, our, our uniform patrols, our parking enforcement, as well as our SAT team, and we'll continue to do so. Can, we, can I just give you one more and then we, because we have other people that would want to ask questions. Would it be a possibility, like we did notice there like in our area, like right in front of the RVs and everything, there's a lot of like dark holes. And I know once in a while I see that the police have those specific lights which are like positioned there. Would that be a possibility that we just put it there so that, I mean, I don't really care if they get in prison or whatever. I just don't want them to be around. So just kind of discourage them. Would that be a possibility? So, so we have we have two camera trailers in the city. Um, we have one that that um, that we can deploy citywide. We also have one that we just acquired from the Tacoma Langley Crossroads Development Association. That is specifically they donated it to us with the agreement that we would only deploy it in the crossroads area. But the one camera trailer we have, we absolutely can evaluate whether or not we can place it there. Uh, we, we had it at um, 4th Avenue and Eastern Avenue because we had a rash of shots fired calls there that were really serious. And you talk about quality of life. We had an incident where a bullet went through a young a, a, a girl's bedroom and we found the, sh you know, the, the, the bullet in, on, on her pillow. So, but we absolutely can evaluate whether or not that would be the best deployment area. Once again, when we deploy that, that piece of equipment, we deploy it to an area that has the most crime and it's going to have the most impact. But uh, we can definitely connect with you after the meeting and, and see if that's a Lieutenant Butler who's up front will connect with you to see if that's a possibility to deploy it there at least an, on, on some you know, temporary basis to, to, as a deterrent. Right, anyone else in the room? We have one more. You get, just wait. Yeah, there we go. I was at the CVS uh, downtown Tacoma Park about three weeks ago, and I noticed someone down in the alley with a dark hood, big black uh, sack, and he just kind of like shoveling things from the shelf into a sack. He was obviously stealing. And I saw him, and I was terrified, and I wanted to do something. And then I noticed an employee of CVS on the other side taking pictures of him. And then, of course, he rushed out. What should I have done when I noticed that? Is there anything, did I have a responsibility to do? Is I just reacting and then talking to the CVS person? At, at, that's, a, that's a good question. This, that CVS, just for everyone, so everyone knows, is not in Tacoma Park. It's in the District of Columbia. But if you're in any drugstore, the first thing you need to worry about is your own personal safety. I can stress that to anyone. 
do not take action or do anything if you're going to jeopardize your own personal safety. But if you see someone committing a crime, I highly, highly suggest that you can, if you can do it safely, that you contact the jurisdiction in question. It can be us if it's in Tacoma Park, or it can be the, uh, the, the D.C. police to report it. You have no obligation to put yourself at risk at any time. And I want to be very clear. No resident has any obligation to put themselves at risk. But we do ask if you can safely report something. Obviously, it's very helpful because we can get the, a description. We may be able to apprehend someone. So just if we're talking about, you know, about uh, those type of drugstores. So we, we have the Walgreens, if you notice from our statistical data, is the, has the highest volume of crime in the city, the one Walgreens we have in the city. Now, we have worked very closely with Walgreens to ensure that if we arrest people, they will prosecute them. Because some jurisdictions, they do not. You'll notice several jurisdictions, they're closing their pharmacies. And you have entire neighborhoods that do not have access to medication. They do not have access to basic things that you need, Advil, diapers, et cetera. So we're very fortunate that we still have a drug store in our jurisdiction that is still a viable store. Now, that's not to say that that volume of, of theft isn't disturbing. But to, to, to answer your question, what you can do in that particular case is safely call 911 and say, I've just observed a theft. Um, I will be candid to say you'll get different reactions in different jurisdictions, just so you know. Um, but I, I, I encourage you to do that safely. Um, do we have anyone else in the room, or do you want to? Okay. Uh, can we bring the mic up? We'll start. Hi, I I have six things because I'm the uh, citizens associate, one of the citizens association presidents, and I've just been. We can cross them off your list because we had them to re to the read list. So we'll. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll, because yeah. I, I emailed it to you yeah. earlier. Kathy. We had it as the to read list. So we'll, go ahead. Okay, so one of the concerns that I've heard, obviously, is the crazy driving that we had about a month ago here at New Hampshire and 410. And I was wondering, uh, a couple of questions with that. One, your, if you could explain your decisions to not intervene, but to call for backup and, and how that was resolved. And um, could you have known about this ahead of time? In other words, was it on social media um, and were you able to identify any of the perpetrators and follow up with any enforcement? Do you want me to read them all or do you want me to just... No, no, no. I, no why don't you just hold on that one? I'll answer okay. that one and, and then we'll, we'll get into the other ones. And I may have Deputy Chief Philippos touch on some of the, the things. So, so, so first and foremost, uh, when we respond to something, you have to understand we have two or three officers and hundreds of people that are armed and are aggressive. So our first priority is to safely shut down that situation and not escalate. Several people had body armor. One person flashed a gun at our officers. They handled it really well. So if they tried to inter intervene and tried to arrest somebody, it could have been catastrophic. So our first priority was to get sufficient backup there, which we did, and shut the event down. Um, and that's what was done. So the officers handled it extremely well. Um, I would not recommend that three officers against hundreds of armed individuals that they intercede. That happened recently in Prince George's County. It resulted in several of the participants being struck by cars fleeing. It also, involved, it also resulted in some shots fired. Uh, so to answer you, I think the second part of that was, um, were we able to identify anyone involved? Yes, we were. And I'll have the deputy chief get into some of the struggles that we had on, on identifying them. And I think the, the second, or the additional question was, are these advertised on social media? Some of them are, absolutely. But a lot of these are done via private WhatsApp chats or something like that. So we need to get somebody in that WhatsApp, WhatsApp chat or whatever device that it, whatever platform that is, to go outside of that to advertise. And they love showing themselves flashing guns and doing spinning wheels and so on and so forth. So um, we are working very closely with our allied jurisdictions to pr prevent incidents like this. So when we know that somebody is thinking about a car meetup at East West in New Hampshire, we're going to pre-stage officers there to prevent them from doing that. The problem is they're very quickly transient and they can move from New Hampshire and East West Highway to another location. And that's what happened in, in the New Hampshire and East West case. They originally were, were going somewhere else 
and there were police at that location, is my understanding, and then they came to our intersection. So we were stuck with the fact that, that the current state law does not give us teeth to do anything. And I'll let the deputy chief touch a little bit on some of this, the state laws that are, are being proposed and that what, it, what, our, what our struggles are now and what we're hoping that the new state laws will allow us to have more teeth to enforce these type of situations. Sure, good evening. Well, those are very good, very good questions. Um, the problem that our officers have is the current laws are, the current laws are violated, they're traffic laws, misdemeanor traffic laws with very moderate fines and very low penalties as far as point assessments to your driver's license. Um, and so these laws don't, don't have very much teeth to uh, prevent these or to stop uh, these kind of activities. The other issue that, uh, that the, you know, the chief touched on is these misdemeanor uh, traffic violations. If an officer attempts to make a traffic stop, um, minus the crowds and all the people there, um, it's very unlikely that these uh, persons or these uh, drivers will stop for the police and a pursuit may, uh, may start. We won't engage in a pursuit, but that vehicle might uh, decide to drive faster or uh, break additional laws in it and, and uh, create more hazards um, and potentially loss of life. So those are some of the concerns that we have uh, when we you know, try to address these issues. Now, as far as the laws are concerned, right now there are two bills on the uh, Senate floor, um, House Bill 212 and House Bill 601. Um, I believe House Bill 601 was proposed or sponsored by Delegate uh, Mary Lehman. Um, and House Bill 601, the majority, uh, if not all, the police departments and police chiefs are in support of both these bills. But House Bill 601, it increases the penalties for these crimes. Um, so this exhibition driving, that, uh, that's what it's being labeled now, um, there's no actual law against that. What I told you, there's minor laws like spinning wheels, you know, exhaust noise, um, driving recklessly. There's all these different misdemeanor laws. So this law, House Bill 601, is attempting to uh, increase the penalties, identify exhibition driving as a, uh, a standalone violation, um, which includes jail time. Now, all these other uh, ancillary uh, laws does not have jail time associated with this. So if this bill passes, um, the way it's written, uh, there will be a maximum of 60 days in jail that the drivers of these vehicles uh, may face, and which includes increased point systems, which can affect their ability to drive, suspensions, et cetera, et cetera. So those are things that will uh, prevent people from engaging in uh, this kind of activity. Um, and so I think we'll, we'll see that. And the, the last bill is a House Bill 212, which is a noise abate, abatement monitoring system pilot program that they're talking about. And so the latest, because crossover was Monday at the state legislature, is that both of those bills have passed the House. They have gone on to the Senate. And if anyone is interested in writing a note, I know a few people have already done. Um, just get in touch with me, and I'll get you the bill number and who the chair of the committee is on the Senate side. And you guys can drop a note. Um, and I would like to ask, add also that the city, not just the police chiefs, but, but the city proper, the city council, endorsed both these bills. All right, can Thank we you. pass the mic back to, so we should, I know she had some other additional questions. Okay, um, the second one is on, on a related to cars. Um, a lot of people have complained about loud cars typically heard, and going up, heard going up and down New Hampshire Avenue. Can anything be done to enforce against that? Um, also, modifying exhaust systems of vehicles is a violation of federal law enforced by the Environmental Protection Agency. And a neighbor reports that she has seen uh, many local shops that advertise that they will modify um, exhaust systems in violation of federal law. Is there any way that we can investigate these shops and coordinate with the EPA for federal enforcement? Um, I know that the enforcement of that exhaust system was a priority for EPA a couple of years ago. I'm not sure it's still a priority, but I could try to help you get some attention to that issue if you would like. 
Uh, to answer your question, yeah, it is, is illegal, illegal to, to, to alter, alter an exhaust system. system. Uh, we have had problems with, with uh, not only loud exhaust systems, but people racing up and down New Hampshire Avenue. And I just want to clarify because there's sections of Ward 2 that uh, do not fall on New Hampshire Avenue, do not fall within the Tacoma Park jurisdiction. So just for clarification, New Hampshire Avenue from East West Highway to the District of Columbia Line is the Prince George's County uh, jurisdiction. From East West Highway to uh, University Boulevard is our jurisdiction. So I know there were some questions about traffic along New Hampshire Avenue along the section that's owned by Prince George's County. And if we get specific questions, we can always refer it to them. Um, you know, I, I'm not aware of any shops specifically in our area. Uh, we'd be happy to connect you with our detectives if you have some specific information that we can add some enforcement tools. We're always looking for that. Uh, but I'm not aware of any shops in our area that are actively in, uh, advertising that they will um, alter um, alter exhaust systems. It would have to be a shop here. We don't have that many shops here in the city, um, but absolutely we can connect via email for more information on that. Okay. Um, the third one is that's been discussed is that there's a concern about cut through traffic on the city streets coming from the state roads to the city streets. And there was a request, can we lower the speed limits in Tacoma Park on our city streets to 15 miles an hour? And are there other measures we can take to slow traffic on our streets and make them less attractive to cut through tr traffic? Um, Public Works has sometimes refused to install requested speed bumps and things like that. So it, it's a difficult process. That's, that's a good question. So a lot of times what we do for these traffic problems is called one-offs. So we'll fix something on one street and cause a problem on another. So uh, the city council um, has directed the city to reevaluate how we um, evaluate traffic calming requests. So we're currently in the process of doing that. So we're gonna have a much more educated, much more formulated process for requesting traffic calming. But I will say that something that also the city is considering and is extremely important is doing a citywide traffic study. Because the problem, like I said earlier, is sometimes if we make one street one way, we, we create overflow traffic for another area. Um, we have been successful um, with the help of, of Councilmember DeBala and others in getting the stop sign installed at, at uh, Lincoln and, uh, what is it, Ethan Allen or Elm, I can't remember which street. So that, that was, we, we used to have an accident there every other day. And since then, I can't remember the last time we responded for an accident there. So there are ways that we are improving traffic safety. Uh, one of the options you mentioned is the 15 mile per hour speed limit. Uh, that's an option as well. Obviously, all of that would have to go through the review process. Can we get uh, Council Member DiBala, Mike? Um, but we, it's something that's really important. It's the state legislative session. What can I say? There's also a bill to, uh, last year, there were, David uh, Delegate Moon had a bill to allow us to do the 50 mile an hour speed limits. But then it, it required a very expensive traffic analysis before you could do it, right? This year, there's a bill that makes that requirement much easier, makes it more along the lines of a survey of, of the traffic, you know, something you can handle in house. That bill has also passed the House and is on its way to the Senate. So, so far, so good. Okay, we're down to number four, which is where are we on getting steering wheel locks for Kia and Hyundai cars that are targeted for theft? Well, as many residents know, we, we passed, we got a bunch of them and we passed them out and they went, uh, it was like in a day or so. So uh, we're looking at, at, at a couple, we're looking at getting them again and passing them out, but we're also looking at getting uh, trackers if your vehicle is stolen. Uh, Montgomery County Police, uh, D.C. had a similar program. So we put money in the next fiscal year budget so we can get those trackers. So if your car is stolen, you can track your vehicle. So we're always looking at ways that we can, number one, prevent a vehicle from being stolen, but also recover it quickly. Because the last thing you want to do when your car is stolen is, you know, is, is not have it for a month or have it burned out. So the quicker we can discover and find where a car is. Um, but we're doing our best to get them in. As soon as we get them in, we'll get them back out. It's, it, it's a definitely a tool that works. Okay, um, and then rental cars and s bikes, rental bikes and scooters. Is it legal or illegal for the companies to leave them on the streets? I'm not talking about people who are using them and leave it in front of their house, but for the companies to drop them off in residential neighborhoods, because it seems like that's doing business in a residential neighborhood. So that was a question that I didn't know about. And then 
um, sometimes you'll see them on the street and they're just sitting there in somebody's yard or blocking parking spaces for weeks. Is there something that we can do to get them removed when they're just taking up space? That was a, another loaded question. You got a bunch of loaded questions tonight. But uh, now, so, so let, me, let me just touch on a few aspects of that. Um, you're not, it's not, you cannot leave the scooters blocking traffic of the so sidewalk. But um, I don't believe the companies are dropping them off and placing them in locations where they're blocking the sidewalk. If that's the case, you can contact us. But I highly suggest if you, if you see a scooter that's blocking the sidewalk, contact the company and advise them. Because when someone rides a scooter, they're supposed to take a picture of where they put it, and they can go back and track who the user was. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's not they're, – they're, they're in the public um, – public roadway and public sidewalk. So it's not illegal. It's not, they're not soliciting by having them because they can, they're, they're authorized to have, whether it be a bike or whether it be a, a scooter, if that helps. Okay. And then um, the last one is just generally, are the businesses on New Hampshire Avenue cooperating with the police in crime prevention and investigations, in a, for example, by providing usable video footage? Absolutely. We'll, we'll make it easy. Just pass it. Pass it to your right. That, that makes it easy. You're, you're good. You're good. So on, you're um, on. Hi. Uh, Sandra Filippi, Ward 2. I live on Belford Place. Um, some of the people in my neighborhood have not reported when someone breaks into their car. They um, are concerned that as your statistics grow, that their car insurance premiums will grow as well. Just a comment. <laughs> So I would think that your statistics are not reflective of reality because people are not reporting because they're afraid. Um, can, I, can I just comment on that? I, sure. I agree. And that's not just in Ward 2. That's citywide. A lot of times people do not want to take the time for various reasons to report crimes. Um, I, I, I highly encourage them to do so. Um, so someone that maybe may have ruffled through your car and taken uh, some change or taken uh, something that's not of extreme value may have been the same person that goes to your neighbor's truck and steals thousands of dollars of tools from him. So we may be able to get video or some evidence, maybe there's a fingerprint on your car that we can attach to the, the crime that occurred with your neighbor. So I, I highly encourage uh, residents, but but we know that that it's factual that that crime is underreported because sometimes people don't bother in reporting it. So go ahead. Um, the jurisdictional issues um, with the different police department partners. So I think um, a few minutes ago you mentioned um, where the city of Tacoma Park has authority and Prince George's County have authority on New Hampshire Avenue. So um, my house is at the corner of Prince George's <coughs> Avenue and Belford Place, and there was a pretty significant accident on New Hampshire Avenue that, um, I don't know what the right word is, but some of the vehicles, or at least one of them, wound up striking one of my neighbor's and my friend's cars. So she was out there watching and listening, and she overheard police officers from both sides, PG and Tacoma Park, debating about whose jurisdiction this was. And it's very clear from what you said, it was Prince George's County. Um, but the officers don't know. So what are we doing to, let, to continually get it through to the officers who's in charge? Because there was, according to my neighbor and friend, there was a delay in reporting um, because of this debate that was going between the jurisdictions. Well, let me, let me just be clear. We, we will respond to calls for service along New Hampshire Avenue. So if we get a call, we're going to respond to it. If we're the first there, we will handle the call until Prince George's County gets there. The same if it's on our side, if it's on, you know, our section of New Hampshire Avenue and they respond. So that, let me be clear, that, that'll happen. There's no question that the first reporting agency is going to respond. Um, I, it, the, the incident, where the incident occurred, where the accident occurred is the jurisdiction. So even if some of the vehicles, if the, if the accident occurred on New Hampshire Avenue but ended up in our jurisdiction, it's Prince George's County's jurisdiction. And I don't know the particular um, dynamic of what occurred on that particular call. Our officers know our jurisdiction, um, and it sounded like they were being very clear about what our jurisdiction was and what theirs was. Um, I can't speak to 
other jurisdictions' knowledge of jurisdiction. I will tell you the fact that we um, abut three different jurisdictions becomes challenging at times to define, especially New Hampshire and uh, university, trying to determine where certain accidents occurs. But I, from, from our perspective, um, we know where our jurisdiction is and our officers are aware of that. So because- Can you, can you talk oh, on the mic just- Sorry. Um, be, because of this jurisdictional issue, is it correct that, that the city of Tacoma Park cannot put a speed camera at New Hampshire Avenue south near Poplar and the Ray intersection, that light? Is that yes, correct? Yes, that, that is correct. We, we can only put speed cameras in our jurisdiction. So if I, I know previously there's been a request to have steep speed cameras uh, uh, assigned on that section of roadway. That would be a Prince George's County decision, and they would have to initiate the speed camera in that particular location. As you probably well know, we have speed cameras all along our section of New Hampshire yeah. Avenue. If you look at our annual report, you'll see the vast majority of traffic collisions that occur in the city have occurred along that roadway. Uh, with our new red light camera program, we also have several intersections that will be getting new red light cameras right. here within the next month or so. Um, I'd like to segue into 911. Um, what is the status of upgrading 911? Sandra Filippi, Board 2. 911, <laughs> what is the status of upgrading the system so that when someone dials 911, um, there isn't confusion about jurisdiction? Um, one of my neighbors and friends. Um, is retired and she is disabled. She has disabled son and grandson living with her. They have a lot of medical issues and they're not always getting help. I, I will say if you call from a landline, it is going to ping your location. That's, that's just without question, but not many people have, have landlines, landlines anymore. Mm -hmm. um, there were drastic improvements made to the 911 system. You, now you still may have situations where you get transferred or you may not connect. It's just the, the, the reality of living along jurisdictional boundaries. So if you're calling from a cell phone and you're on New Hampshire Avenue at East West Highway, but you're on the New Hampshire Avenue side, um, you may get us instead of Prince George's County. So it's, it's not a perfect science, but we're really working on trying to make sure that, that, that once a call is received, um, it, the appropriate jurisdiction is dispatched. If not, that you are transferred to the appropriate jurisdiction immediately. Uh, one, one more question and then I'll see it to someone else. Um, the statistics that were given to us about arrests and case closures, how do those compare with um, the state the country? Um, are there standards? There, there, are, there are closure, average closure rates and so on and so forth. Um, I don't have them readily available, but we'd be more than happy to supply them to you as far as, as far as closure rates for certain crimes like homicides or so on and so forth. But we don't have that readily available. I'd be happy to get, to get it for you. If you need specific information, just email it. No. Um, why don't we do this? Uh, why don't we go to the Zoom question since we've taken a lot in the room and then we'll circle back to the room. So Kathy, could you read um, some of the Zoom questions? Sure, and uh, Persini Dabala, if you have a question and you don't know this, you can put it in the webinar chat. Um, you don't have to text your council member. You can just put it in there. And we're gonna try to get to all of them. And if we don't, please feel free to send them to me in an email and we'll get you answers afterwards, even if they didn't get read this evening. So with that said, the first one is, while there have been no homicides in Ward 2, there were three at Tacoma Towers just across the street. Um, were the three related, and are you working with Prince George's County on them, and there's, there's something about that property that attracts this activity? Uh, the jurisdiction in question is Prince George's County. Prince George's County homicide section is working on that. Our detectives are not working on that particular case. And since it's not our case, I really don't know specifics and I can't really comment on the apartment complex. I'm not familiar with problems there. That would be a question specifically for the Prince George's County Police Department. I don't want to comment on something that I'm not aware of. Okay. Uh, do you know how many of the arrests for burglaries, robberies, are the same individual, and specifically, is there an individual arrested charged with the responsibility for several of the crimes? 
You will find in our annual report that a lot of times the same perpetrator is responsible for multiple burglaries, multiple robberies. So yes, it can be a lot of times, as I said earlier, um, when we close a case here in the city of Tacoma Park, we are also able to close cases in other jurisdictions. Uh, normally, uh, you know, we had a, a rash of shed burglaries. We made an arrest for that. As I said earlier, we had the, the, uh, the food truck robberies that we made an arrest for that. He was responsible for multiple different food robberies. So the answer is yes. A lot of times individuals are responsible for multiple different incidents. Uh, as recently as last night, a group of six individuals were checking car handles on Conway Avenue. A neighbor called it in and a cruiser came by, but what else can be done? It's almost a nightly occurrence now. I would say this, continue to call us um, because we will respond. The good thing is a cruiser responded. And if we continue to get those calls, we will, we will place resources in that area. So if, if, if any commuter member is seeing something that's continuously happening, they can email Kathy, they can email me, they can email the, the patrol commander, and we'll have someone check on that specific time and specific area. As I said earlier, a lot of what we do deployment-wise is based on t statistics, but a lot of it also is from what we hear from you. So if you're saying well, the same guys every night at 8 o'clock are walking down my street and checking door handles, then we can have a cruiser, we, number one, in the area. We can do it this way. We can have our SAT team in the area to try to apprehend them, or we can have a cruiser sitting on the street with their lights on to deter it. So there are multiple different ways. So communication, communication, communication is critical. If you're seeing something, let us know. If you're seeing something, let us know, because the patrol officer might know it was just one occasion, not that there was a continual, uh, continual occasion. We, we, are, we, we have the ability to be very proactive and very reactive here in the city of Tacoma Park. Uh, we, have, we have calls, but we're not continuously running calls. So we want our officers to be out proactive in the neighborhoods deterring crime and apprehending criminals. So um, please, 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 whoever that was, continue to call us. Uh, you highlighted the top five crime sites. However, what are you doing about hot spots that are not limited to one address, but clearly seem to be hot areas, for example, blocks, neighborhood units? Obviously, there is a lot of crime at 7-Eleven, and it seems to be spilling over into the areas around it. How are you going to handle that? And is 7-Eleven assisting you? Yeah, that's a really good question, and, and, and a lot of our businesses, our stakeholders, are, are really good partners, and they work very closely with us. I think there was a question earlier about do they give us uh, video surveillance? Absolutely. Um, they allow us to, 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 you know, to work with them. Uh, they are very cooperative. Anytime we have a hot spot area, uh, we analyze all of the surrounding area. So we have enforcement details throughout the city, and it is specifically based on occurrences of crime. But we also have our officers on a daily basis actively patrolling. So our officers know hot spots, not just the hot spots, the top five that were mentioned, but they also know their beats. They know where the problem areas, they know where the thefts are, they know where uh, the RVs are, they know all these things. So they're able to be proactive outside of the scope of these targeted details. Um, so. The 7-Eleven, for example, is a hot spot. We know that. We know that that is. So we have resources allocated there. And anytime you have a site like that, whether it be Walgreens, whether it be the 7-Eleven, uh, the surrounding area, as I think was mentioned, is affected as well. So we need to focus on that and the overflow crime. Um, a lot of times, and we touched on this in the Ward 6 meeting, a lot of these incidents are tied to fentanyl and drug abuse fentanyl and drug abuse. So we need to understand that as well and that intersection. And I can't forego any meeting without saying it until we start taking a holistic approach to this problem, public safety, not just a police response, we're going to have the same problem. We need to start looking at the root causes that is causing people to commit criminal acts, whether that be lack of education, lack of uh, jobs, lack of what have you. If we do not do that, all we're doing is putting a Band-Aid on a gaping chest wound. So I, 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 I get on my soapbox every time to say that, that, you know, we are just, we are the enforcement agent of society, but we need to make sure that our society is one that does not perpetuate and allow criminal activity. 
Um, you know, I speak a lot about some of the programs that, that I think are really beneficial. One, for those who've been around the District of Columbia for a while or this area, Marion Berry's Summer Job Youth Program was so successful. So if you wake up and you have a job, you can go make money, you can feel good about yourself, you can spend the money that you make as opposed to waking up not having any food in your house, no parents there because they're working three jobs, and you're hungry, and you don't have anything to do, so what are you going to do? You're going to go out and break in a car or do something else. So we just need to start taking that look, and I didn't mean to get off on my soapbox, so we'll move on to the second, uh, the next question. Yeah. Um, can there be better support for traffic by Tacoma Park Elementary School? During school hours, it can take 10 to 15 minutes to get from Ward 2 to the Kiss and Ride. Some of the drivers block Holly Street. Last week, a school bus was stuck because of the backup at 345. Uh, can the stop signs that direct traffic, no turns until after 430, have lights on them? Some of our community may not read English or notice the signs when in a rush leaving drop-offs. Um, I, I can tell you, in and around all of our, both of our elementary schools is extremely congested. Anyone that's driven by our municipal center know that there's a library project there. And it has drastically Im impacted just traffic congestion. Um, we have worked very, very closely with all the principals of all of our schools. We have monthly meetings with the administration and principals. And one of the things that we addressed specifically was some signage that was old and not updated at Tacoma Park Elementary School that caused some confusion about you know, where people should come in and go out. Um, you know, we will enforce if people are blocking, you know, blocking roadways or doing anything illegal. But the reality of it is um, most likely people are going to sit. I, I sit in traffic every, every morning when I drop my daughter off at middle school. It's frustrating, but sometimes there's not much we can do. And I don't want to, you know, say we can fix this when some things we can fix. And we have crossing guards all along that section to ensure that the kids are are, are coming to and from safely. And that's the, that's what I really want to make sure, that, that our kids are able to get to school safely. And I feel confident that, that any kid traversing from any of one of our schools in that particular area, whether it be the middle school, whether it be the two elementary schools, is doing so safely. But, um, you know, like I say, it's it, we're open to any suggestions, if there's signage suggestions and so on and so forth. I think they mentioned the flashing lights on the stop signs. We have them in some of our, our jurisdictions. That would be a public works question. Uh, I think we had one uh, down here in Ward 6, and I know there's one at, uh, at Ritchie and Piney Branch. Um, they do stand out, and I think that that's something that the city is evaluating, whether or not that would be a, a benefit to have those at more stop signs in the city. We'll go one. Or take the school bus. Can, can, we, can we send a mic just so? Sorry, I wasn't sure. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right, we'll do one more online, and then we'll uh, go back to the room. Uh, I wanted to express my gratitude to the police chiefs and the officers for the excellent work they are doing. As we start budget season for the next fiscal year, what resources do you need to be even more effective, and what do you need to fill the open positions, positions you currently have? I mean, that's a good question. I, I will say that the city council has been supportive of the police department. Um, we currently uh, have uh, four sworn vacancies. So we have 43 sworn officers within the city of Tacoma Park a lot. And we have uh, 39 currently. Uh, we used to, we were pretty close to fully staffed for, for the last two or so years, but we're a lot closer. Some, some departments have vacancies in the, in the neighborhood of 30 or 40 percent. Um, so we're actively recruiting uh, officers. But, but I want to stress to the community, and I've said this repeatedly as well, quality, not quantity, when it comes to hiring. Quality, not quantity. We want people that are going to come to Tacoma Park because they understand the values here. They understand the type of policing that we do. And we've been very, very successful in getting quality people coming to the city of Tacoma Park Police Department. We have hired over 75% of our police department in the last six years. We are a diverse police department that is almost exactly reflective of the demographics of the city. We speak six different languages, and multiple people within our agency are fluent in Spanish, and that's important. Uh, but what can the community do? They can continue to support the police department uh, with acknowledgments like the individual just did. Uh, but when it comes to um, reaching out to your council member uh, mm -hmm. to support um, you know, our budget, um, so I'll just give you an example of the support the city council provided us. 
Um, we, as a result of this crime in increase, uh, we, as I said earlier, had to deploy a lot of overtime resources, whether that be plain clothes or overtime, to address the, the trends. Uh, we had to go back to the council and ask for additional overtime funds. They supported that because they understood the importance of keeping you all safe. So that's a way that they supported us. But if you really want to support us, you can always come out and speak at the council. You can call your council member. You can do whatever. But I think we have a really, really good partnership. I think you have a council and I think you have an administration here in the city that really supports public safety and understands the importance of keeping Tacoma Park, the inclusive, safe community, requires that we have a good police department. And I have found in the six years I've been here that the council and the administration have been very supportive of that, as well as the community. Do we want to rotate to any anyone in the room have a question? Uh, go to. Can you can you they asked if they asked if you could stand up and just speak loudly. Uh, Two quick questions. How much was the overtime addition? The additional money that went from that was uh, paid from. Uh, I don't recall specifically. We had we had cut our overtime budget to meet uh, some uh, citywide mandated cuts mm -hmm. uh, because of the traditional crime trend. But all of that can be found uh, via the budget, the third budget amendment, which is on our website. Okay. But I, I, we could, I don't know the specifics offhand. No, I, I was just curious because we hear a lot of like got to call the, you know, call in something. You see something, but it's not a free roll. You know, it, it does cost money. It, it gets paid out of overtime, gets paid out of taxpayers. So. Just something to keep in mind. Can I just um, say, responding to basic calls for service do not come out of overtime. Okay. That is a basic call for service. I would nev never want to discourage somebody for calling for police service because they thought that it would cost more money. That's just a basic call for service is going to be answered regardless. Well, I just meant, like, if you have, you know, X amount more calls over a year, you'll see that you know, it's taking up more police hours that you're going to have, you know, for few. Anyways, my point being that, like, it, it does take police res resources to... All right, putting that aside... Um, my other question was, were there any uh, car meetups before the, in Tacoma Park before the one that happened in February? Do you know? Not to that level. We had a similar kind of smaller, I think, thing. Was it New Hampshire and University? But, but nothing of the magnitude of the one we had uh, recently. Did, did we have any after that? Not, that? not that we're aware of, no. Okay. So it happened once, right? Okay. Well, I, I thought, y'all, I, I live like within a stone's throw of where it happened. And it was like, at most, a minor inconvenience being woken up. But it would have been really terrifying to me if there was violence or if it was dispersed, you know, in a way where people were getting arrested or hurt. And so I thought the department actually did an amazing job uh, clearing it. You know, it was 15 minutes of horns. It's not that bad. You know, I was able to just fall asleep right after it happened. Um, but I don't think people realize how dangerous it is it might be to disperse a large crowd or disperse an unpermitted large crowd or an unpermitted large crowd at night, you know, in the middle of the streets with cars. It's incredibly challenging, and it required you know, coordination with all the police departments as well. I thought the police department did a really excellent job with that. So Appreciate that. Yeah. Now in the room. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask about the Washington McLaughlin School, and I know we're having a, a Zoom meeting with our council member tomorrow about you know, some work that's going to be done in the school. Oh, uh, no. okay. oh I'm sorry. That's right. Uh, next Monday. Um, whenever I call in, they always ask for the address, 6501 Poplar. But the whoever is trespassing or vandalizing are coming in the back entrance. I just want to make sure that all of your officers know that that's where the real problem is, but, is but, the entrance from Woodland and Circle. Yes, ma'am. We, we, are, we are keenly aware of, of where the problem area is at the McLaughlin School. Just mm -hmm. So, so it, it, very timely, I was just advised by our uh, housing and community development uh, uh, department head that they will be boarding up yeah. that facility. And that's been the bigger problem is it's just been attractive. It, it's been an eyesore that's been right. attractive to, to some of our younger kids, but also some to, to other nefarious activity. But I can tell you, all of our officers are keenly aware of where the problem area is. We, we've had multiple calls okay. there. So we're hopeful that it getting boarded up yeah. uh, will go a long way to us not having to respond uh, as much for right. calls for services. Yeah, I, I appreciate that very much. I appreciate the Zoom meeting that, that Cindy has set up. Um, the other issue is the parking lot at night, especially in warm weather months. Um, cars often come in there anytime from 11 a.m. to 3 a.m. 
they might stay for a little while, then they drive out, another car might come in at the same time, people are kind of going back and forth. Um, if that could be put on your list of places to patrol regularly. I call whenever I see something, but I'm sure I don't, don't see it all the time. I, I see our operations commander writing feverishly as you're speaking, so <laughs> it is already noted. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else in the room? Got one more up front. Do you know what the time, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> But do you know what the time frame is for the citywide traffic study that you mentioned? I will say it is it is a wish list of the police department, public works, and other departments, mm -hmm. but it, there's no timetable. It hasn't been funded. Something like that would take a significant amount of, of funding to do, um, but it is something that we are discussing within the scope of the new traffic calming and so on and so forth. We just think that that is the best way to start out a new traffic calming policy is to have a comprehensive study to understand what the bigger problems are. But as of right now, we don't have the, the funding for it. We're hoping with the new red light camera revenue that we'll be able to, to, to conduct that study through that red light camera, uh, red light camera revenue. Um, so we won't, it won't be tax, it won't be taxpayer funded dollars. It would be come from that red light revenue. So that's what we're hoping. Um, but we don't know, we're trying to evaluate how many, what the volume of violations will be and what the revenue will be to see if we have enough within that within that uh, fund to be able to fund um, that type of study. Uh, just so you know, um, part of um, the, the red light camera fund will fund a traffic planner that would be the one that would initiate that kind of traffic study, the RFP for a traffic study, and so on and so forth. So there's, it's not imminent, but it's something that we want to do within the city. We feel like it's really important. One has not been done for as long as I can remember, so. Do we wanna go, do we have anybody else in the room or do we wanna to go to Zoom questions? We can go to some Zoom questions. Go ahead, Kathy. Uh, the next one I, if you don't mind, I can answer like the first part of it. Absolutely. Can email alerts from the police department related to car break-ins include info on whether the car was unlocked? Keeping our cars locked can be a major deterrent. For the first part, the crime analyst does keep track of whether your car was locked or unlocked when it was broken into. I don't put that out personally because I don't want to victim blame or shame someone because they left their door unlocked and make it seem like that's why they got robbed. Um, keeping your cord doors locked is important, but more important than that is taking property out of your vehicle. Sometimes they're not just pulling on handles. Sometimes they're just looking in your window to see what's in there. If there's a laptop, if there's a bag, it doesn't matter if it's just your gym clothes. If there's coins in the, in the, in the thing in the middle, if there's sunglasses, it could be anything. If they see something, they'll break your window. It doesn't matter whether your door is locked or not. So more important, locking your doors is really important, but more important than that is taking everything out of your car. And if it's a pain, put it in your trunk, just because out of sight, out of mind. Um, sorry, Chief. Oh, no, Have, feel free. You can I, answer I, the next I, one if I, you I, want. I ad, ad nauseum put out information about car thefts and what to do, theft from autos and taking stuff out. And uh, now I'm going to get off my soapbox. <laughs> I, I will. I will say that that as far as what the information that Kathy puts out, I don't know of any jurisdiction that puts out as much information as we do. We put out daily information. We put out weekly information. We want you all to know. It can be found on our website. We think it's really important for situational awareness that you know if there's a crime trend in your neighborhood. So if you know that there's a rash of of robberies along New Hampshire Avenue at the gas stations, you're going to be much more aware and not probably fill up at 10 o'clock at night. Um, you know, so it's very important for situational awareness. Kathy does a fantastic job in, in putting that stuff out. Kudos to her. Thank you. Do you support holding a fentanyl awareness event here in Tacoma Park? Many other county jurisdictions already have done so. I can answer that one, Kathy. Uh, I'm working with Montgomery College right now. Uh, we had a venue for April 10th, but due to some uh, unforeseen circumstances, that venue is not available. Uh, that week because of some uh, issues inside the building that need repair. We're currently looking at another venue or another date to hold it, but that will be an opioid awareness as well as a Narcan training dis and distribution. So as soon as we get everything uh, set, we will uh, get that uh, in place and we'll push it out. 
Is the city looking at the tagging issue? I know that there are many teens who are tagging signs, mailboxes, buildings, et cetera. I feel like there is room for education. I don't know that these kids know what the consequences of defacing public or private property are. Someone else want to take that? Anybody? Yeah, I mean, we, we do, uh, when we get reports of graffiti or tagging, our detectives, our officers take the reports and our detectives do evaluate them to see if they're gang related, et cetera. Um, it's, it's difficult to identify the individuals who are doing the tagging. Normally we receive the calls after it's done. Um, if we do find an area where tagging occurs routinely after we clean it up, we can set up cameras, et cetera, and uh, we have had success in the past with that, but that's not, that's, that's not very common for that to occur. So normally, if you see tags in your neighborhood or uh, wherever it may be, uh, contact the jurisdiction. If it's in the city of Tacoma Park, please call us so that we can uh, take a report on it and we can monitor where the tags are occurring and we can identify if it's uh, gang related or if it's, uh, or if it's not, et cetera. Um, so yeah, please continue to call us and uh, we will respond out each time and uh, monitor the activity. Right. Um, Stay on Zoom. Okay. There's a lot. So. Oh, okay. Well, we'll continue to go. If anyone in the room feels a need, just raise your hand and we'll circle back into the room. If you guys heard something that you want to ask a question on, but we'll, we'll stay on Zoom for a little bit. And Okay. We, we, we'll, we'll go. Can, can, we, can we give you a mic? Just give you Here. right behind you. There you go. I just want to ask the question about the fentanyl. Is that a serious problem yes. in this area? Yes. Wow. All right, Kathy, let's go to the Zoom. Should we be concerned whether we see a helicopter overhead? It seems to be happening more frequently. Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, there are medical support helicopters. There's different, there's TV helicopters. There's a multitude of, of things, but not necessarily. If there's any concern, you can always call the police department and ask, is, should there be anything that you're concerned about? I see a helicopter above me. I mean, we, we um, I can't remember the last time we utilized a helicopter here in the city for a criminal offense so um the big of it no yeah i mean normally when you see a helicopter it's usually due to a traffic collision or a traffic accident and helicopter news choppers are monitoring uh traffic movement and reporting on that all right let's go to the next one what percentage of car break-ins involved unlocked cars and unlocked cars? An estimate is fine. I asked our crime analyst, and she just said a lot. I don't think we have the exact number. I, I can give a rough estimate. Again, I keep track of every vehicle break-in that occurs and whether there was forced use or whether the car was unlocked for the year of 2023. Um, it was it was at like at least 50 percent of cars that were unlocked that you know the suspects broke into. Um, and you know it's you know it's no one's fault. It just happens. But uh, definitely encourage people to lock their cars. And in 2024, just uh, from the beginning of the year to the present, um, those numbers have definitely changed. Um, there are much. Uh, there's definitely a decrease in uh, vehicle break-ins where force was used or force was not used and the vehicles were unlocked. Um, so people are listening, and that's really good. Um, and yeah, so definitely continue to lock your cars or start locking your cars if you haven't um, because, you know, if your car is unlocked, if a suspect, you know, tries to break in, they're definitely going to. Um, but if it's not, there's a chance that they might not. So, yeah. I would also add as important as locking your cars is, is removing valuables from your vehicle. Uh, a lot of times people leave a book bag, whether it's gym clothes in the book bags that have no value, uh, a suspect who sees that sees a, a potential item that they can steal. So lock your car doors, remove all your valuables, your garage door openers, cash, coins, um, anything that's in there that's valuable, please remove. All right, we'll go back to Zoom. Actually, there's just one more because um, it says there's a lot, but I read them all. Okay. So there might be actually one more now. Well, I'll read this one that I have and then I'll go to the last one. Is there not? I lost it. Is there an opportunity to do a citywide graffiti cleanup? Um, I wouldn't say no. I just don't know how that would be coordinated. Um, some of the graffiti is on private property, some on public property. 
Um, but yeah, that's something I'm not sure who's asking that. If you could just ask whoever that is to contact you directly, we can get a little bit more information and figure out logistically what they're what they're looking to do. Uh, shouldn't the fact that 50% of car break-ins involved unlocked cars outweigh shaming victims? I'm going to pass that back to you. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I think that I, I agree with, with Kathy's assessment not to, to shame victims. The last thing we want to do is, is discourage people from contacting us because they think that they're going to be shamed by their neighbor because they left their door open. A lot of times you might be coming home, you might have two kids that you're trying to bring, you're trying to bring in the groceries, and you might forget to lock your car, it happens. Um, and I'm not saying there, that's all of them, but the last thing we want to do is, is discourage people from reporting it. We have the information, that's what's important, so we can analyze the information and we can continue the outreach as we're doing. And it sounds like thus far in 2024, people are getting home with people and they're, and they're understanding. But... Um, to answer the question, no, I think we, we err on the side of not um, shaming or offending people. I think we always should. Yeah, there's absolutely no shame in accidentally leaving your car unlocked or even on purpose. It, it just happens to the best of us, you know. Um, but it's still very important to report any crime that does occur, any vehicle break-in that does occur, uh, just so we have that information on uh, the location of where it occurred, the day it occurred, et cetera, so that we can use uh, that information to deploy our, you know, patrol officers and resources effectively. Um, so, yeah, don't be afraid of being shamed. No one's, no one's shaming you. And yeah. that's true even if nothing's stolen, right? You want to know, even if it was just rummaged through, you keep track of that. Yes, and um, I think to address um, something that one of the residents here said earlier about um, you know, reports of, uh, multiple groups of individuals um, or groups of multiple individuals uh, going through neighborhoods and trying uh, to try the handles of cars um, on a regular basis um, every <coughs> single report that every single report that uh, gets that um, gets reported to the police that comes across my desk and I take the information and categorize it and <coughs> use it to analyze that data um, and to my knowledge that um, reports of that specific those specific incidents of um, groups of multiple individuals coming on a, on a nightly, weekly basis, et cetera, um, I've not gotten information of that report. So um, just to encourage you, so if you do see that again, please, please report it uh, because it will be labeled as an attempted <coughs> theft from auto um, and then we'll have that information and know to deploy resources there more frequently. There you go. Yeah. So. Not not shaming. Yeah, not shaming, but just oh. definitely, please, please report it. Otherwise, nothing's going to. Ron, be can we get a mic so. up front? And I think we have a question in the back as well. Once she finishes. Sandra Felipe again. I would be remiss if I didn't bring this up because I do every meeting I attend. I live on Belford Place, which is part of Area Five um, permit parking, and please, please do something about <laughs> illegal people illegally parking in that area. Can you give the mic to Captain Evans? He'll, he'll address us. Hello, I'm Captain Evans, Operations Commander. Um, thank you for asking that question. We have been addressing that. We have two park enforcement officers who diligently work down there. And actually in that specific <laughs> area that you just spoke about, we've had 113 citations on Belfort Place and 30 citations on Belfort Drive. So we are doing everything. And like the chief alluded to, the more you call, the more you let us know. That's where we will send our resources. Um, a lot of people within that permit parking area come across the street from Tacoma Towers, formerly known as Belfort Towers. Um, it's their satellite parking lot. And they park along, um, some people call it Prince George's Avenue, um, some people call it New Hampshire Avenue service road. And every day, there's five, six, seven cars parked along there. I do litter patrol, and it's really disgusting what people throw out of their cars that park there. So my question is, can that stretch of road be marked no parking, and what would I have to do as a citizen, as a resident, to request that? 
Uh, there's a there's a city process if you go to the website that, to, to request signage. But but my question would be, are, do any of your neighbors park there? So if you do yeah. that, because a lot of times uh, we do that and then neighbors come out and say, well, you're restricting my parking. But there's a process um, the city has for requesting such. Uh, the city manager can approve such signage. Um, so we, if you, it's pretty clear on the website. But if you email me, I can definitely steer you in the right direction. Can you can you get the my mic? Neighbor and friend Tony, oh, yeah. My neighbor and friend Tony, who's at the corner of Belford Place in New Hampshire, he's just beside himself. You know, we we're going to team up on this. So, thank you. Absolutely. Can we can we pass the mic to the gentleman in the in the back? Um, when you say that um, fentanyl is a major problem and this is a determinant of crime, can you talk a little bit more about that? Is that is it that it's just permeated to come apart like it's permeated everywhere, or is this a trafficking issue? Have you had seizures, or is this users from other places coming in and committing crimes in, in Tacoma Park? It's just a chronic problem region-wide with, with usage. Um, a lot of people that are fentanyl addicted uh, commit the petty crimes, whether or not that's shopliftings, it's breaking in cars, et cetera. It's not unique to the city of Tacoma Park, and we don't have chronic dealers or anything like that. We just have users, and and it is it is uh, really uh, devastating our community, um, not just Tacoma Park, but also regionally. Um, so it, it's something that, um, as Ron said earlier, uh, you know, we're doing everything we can um, to you know educate the public. I highly suggest that that everyone have Narcan readily available. Um, we have it at all of our facilities. We were just talking about that this morning at our senior leadership team meeting. We have it at our library. Our staff have been uh, have, have been taught on it. The good thing about Narcan is if you administer it, there are no side effects. So if you administer it to somebody that you think is is having uh, you know uh, an overdose, but they're having a seizure, there's no side effects to it. Uh, so it's a win-win. Um, but it, it's just it, it's a problem that that is is devastating. I won't even say the region. I think the country. Um, and it's, it's, I haven't seen anything this significant, uh, for those who've been around long enough, when the crack epidemic started in the 80s, um, it, it was, you know, this is similar. It is just addictive. And, and this, unfortunately, uh, you know, is, is such a killer, uh, where crack was not an immediate killer. Uh, fentanyl is. Um, so, you know, we're working very closely. Our detectives are to, you know, determine um, you know, working with other allied agencies to, to see if we can address the fentanyl issue um, in a larger scope um, that's affecting the smaller petty crimes here in the city. And, and just to be clear, this is th these are uh, Tacoma Park residents who are having trouble with this. I would say both, both Tacoma Park residents and residents that live outside the city. So, for example, in Ward 6, um, a lot of the incidents that occur at the Walgreens are not committed by people that live in Tacoma Park. Well, the Walgreens is literally right on the, the corner of our jurisdiction. But there are a lot of people in the city of Tacoma Park that are addicted to fentanyl. It's not just, um, it's not just residents outside of here. So we're not, we're not squeaky clean in that regard. All right, do we have any more in the room? Can I ask one more from Zoom? Sure, sure, absolutely. I think it's important. I notice a lot of reports of possible gunfire. I have called in two of them, but most of us are not very experienced with what guns sound like. Do you think people are often calling in cars backfiring, or is there some way we can get educated, including me, on telling the difference so we aren't giving you bad information? I, I would say this, always err on the side of calling us. If we can come out and we can inspect the area and ascertain whether or not it is actual gunfire or something different. Um, it, it normally, when it's gunfire, there's more than one person calling. It's not just one person calling. If it's one person calling, it may be a backfire. It may be something else. It may have been, uh, you know, various different things. But, um, you know, nine times out of ten, if someone, you know, unless it's on July 4th <laughs> or, or New Year's or other holidays where we get these plethora of calls, but we, we know they're not gunshots, um, I don't, I don't know if there's a public service we can look into something that defining what a what gunshots sound like compared to backfires. They sound a lot alike. 
So I don't know that that's, I don't want to discourage people by, by giving that information. And they're like, oh, well, I, you know what I heard, I'm not sure. I think it's, so I always there just on, on calling us. If you, if you hear something that sounds like a gunshot, call us. We'll come out and check it out. Um, you know, and, and, and if it is, um, better that you called us. If it's not, um, you know, our officers are getting paid to, to mm -hmm. respond as well. So, And there, there's so many different types of weapons and guns out there that make different types of noises. Mm -hmm. um, so as the chief said, err on the side of caution. And if you hear something that sounds to you like it's a gunshot, give us a call. Do you have any more on Zoom? Um, DC installed shot spotter microphones to triangulate the gunshots. Is that possible for Tacoma Park? We do not have, let me be clear, we do not have the problems that the District of Columbia has with in that regard. So I, I don't think that's technology that we need here in the city of Tacoma Park. <laughs> oh, that's it? All right, does anyone else have anything, any questions in the room? All right, so I, I really appreciate those that have joined us here. I appreciate the people on Zoom. Um, I want to stress, if you have any questions that were not answered or you think of something after you leave here, uh, you can send it to Kathy. And what we'll do is we'll answer that question and we'll include it in the, in the information that we put out. So this, re this meeting was recorded. Um, we are going to put this recording out on our website. Um, we also are going to share the questions that were, that were asked and any additional questions that we get in as well as the PowerPoint. Um, so with that, does anyone have anything else before we close? Yes, ma'am. Can the we just, website. What is the website? okay. Can we just get you the mic? The question was, what is the website? Yeah. Anyone that is, are you signed up for Kathy's social media alerts? I He's don't yes. know. If you Am don't I? know, you are not. Can we connect you with Kathy love, after the I meeting so she can get you signed up? Because there's a Absolutely. plethora of information, yes. everything from crime alerts. You can select what you want to know from the city to a tree fell down or a road is blocked or so. Whoever. OK. It sounds like there are a couple people in the room that are I not signed up. So so. So can we, can anybody that in the room that it does not, is not signed up, please get with Kathy. Kathy is up here in the front. And Kathy, can you put your information in the chat? Because I'm assuming that if we have people in the room, we probably have people at home that do not have your information. Okay. Reach out to Kathy. Um, also, any, I'll tell you, it's a lot of information. So if you just want to see it weekly, it's also posted to the website there. Someone just asked to be removed because they were getting a lot of information. But I would want to know. Uh, but yeah, I'll put my information in here, and if you want to give me your email and name, I can sign you up. And I'll also have it in my weekly news newsletter for those of you who get it, and plug. If you don't get my weekly newsletter, see me afterwards. Can, can we get the mic to? Oh, yeah. Can can we keep the? If it's people at home are wondering what's going on because we're not on the mic, so can we? Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Sandra Felipe. Um, I did want to say, um, in addition to crime, I know tonight's focus was on crime, but the emails that Kathy sends out during the winter months um, telling us how to be safe, where to go for if we're cold or we know someone that's cold, how to protect our pets, um, how to protect our homes, what to do to uh, weatherproof them. I mean, all this good information is... Um, valuable to me as a resident, and I really, really appreciate it. And I don't care if she sends the same email <laughs> 50 times because I forgot, and it's a good If it's reminder. related to an animal, she'll send it 100. Yeah. She's, but, but, yeah. Thank yeah. you very Definitely. much. You're Thank very you. Well. Very productive meeting. Thank you. All right, does well, anyone else? Oh. Right oh. Had his hand up for Go ahead. Uh, Thomas Schmidt, uh, Kentland, New Hampshire. I, um, and again, uh, again, thank you for having the meeting. I really appreciate it. And uh, despite us saying like what we have problems with, we also want to tell you that we appreciate you guys serving our community, and especially like all of those outreach programs like getting free hamburgers and hot dogs. <laughs> it's great. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, did you have a question? Um, I just wanted to add while people are signing up for things is that we do send out Kathy's uh, crime reports pretty much as soon as I get them to both Sasco lists, the South of Sligo Citizens Association. There's announcements and discussion 
Um, and if anyone wants to sign, if you're, if you're a resident of SASCA, you can sign up for the discussion list, but anyone can sign up for the announcements list. And we send out the crime reports, as well as a lot of other community news um, pretty regularly. Yeah, I'm glad you do that because when we went to MailChimp, they wouldn't let us send to listservs anymore. We had to have everybody sign up individually. So I'm glad that you can do that. All right. Does anybody have anything else? All right. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. If any, anyone has my email, they have Kathy's email. Please follow up. Have a great evening.